It's Wednesday afternoon. I'm Linda Kenny Bodden. This is the Long Crime Network, and we are in the trial of Florida. It's a death penalty case versus Henry Segura for a quadruple homicide. It's a retrial. Let's listen to Officer, it's actually Lieutenant April Wilder on the stand. She is a homicide detective. Okay, so it's an exciting day because we're watching a trial, we're watching justice in the courtroom live, but the problem is there is a crime scene video that is having a little trouble being played. So while they're trying to get their act together in the courtroom, because technology is not always 100%, let me bring my favorite guest on, and it is Gene Rossi from the great state of Virginia. Hello, Gene Rossi. Go Blue Wave. Well, Gene, you know, you're in my heart all the time, especially when it comes to crime and crime discussion. So let me analyze this with you. This is a retrial. This is a crime that was committed November 2010. In 2017, Henry Segura took the stand and the jury had a hung verdict, which means they couldn't come to a decision. He is now being retried. Do you see, having looked at both cases, any evidence in this case that's going to be different from the first case that may change the verdict? One way or another? Not really. I just, the only advantage is when there's a retrial, the government has a little bit more opportunity to fine tune their case, find out the holes, all right? That's good for the government. The negative is the defense attorney has transcripts from the first trial, so they have ample room for more cross-examination. And I heard the defense and the prosecution opening statements this morning, especially the defense, and the motivation from the prosecution is supposedly there's a $20,000 judgment for non-payment of child support that Henry Secura then killed his girlfriend, the mother of his child, Brandy Peters, for. But the defense said in opening that indeed he has another similar judgment with another woman, because I guess he was a little bit of a philanderer uh, for another child, and he learned how to work around it. Does that help the prosecution? any? No, I got to tell you this. I didn't interview the inter uh, jurors in the first trial, but, but the government wants the jury to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Segura owed $20,000, even though he owed it to other women, or at least one other woman, and that motive alone caused him to kill four people. That is quite a leap including his own three-year-old child. Now, I also heard something from the prosecution that I happen to know a little bit about. That is, the prosecution said that Mr. Segura is not a hit person. He put the wrong bullets in the gun, and therefore, one of the bullets that went through his victim didn't, didn't come out of her head, her body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I tried a little case called Phil Spector back, uh, you know, about uh, 10, 14 years ago, you know, 14 years ago, actually. And there was a bullet to the head, a shot to the head by the same caliber type of gun that didn't exit the poor victim's head. It doesn't, it doesn't occur sometimes, right, Gene? You've seen cases. It depends what the bullet hits in the body. Oh, for, oh, for God's sakes. Yes, absolutely. And a, and a 22 caliber bullet could go through a body, and, and it could not go through a body. I don't know if that's a good argument for the government, but it goes back. They're trying to put a square peg in a round hole when it comes to motive. The $20,000 does not move me. And where, where do now we also have, let me see, and I will count them, a suspect in a cartel, a drug cartel called the Los Zeto Cartel, Carlos Santos, his name is James Carlos Santos, he said he's going to testify that he ordered the hit on Brandy Peters because she was skimming $100,000 off drug deals, and that, that he may be connected, according to the defense, to two people who also confessed, that's the Mario Paramore and Hayward Griffith. So tell me, how many suspects do we need to have to have a hung jury? <laughs> Oh, my God. I will say this. If they were prosecuting that alleged drug cartel guy, then the prosecution would have a good motive because drug dealers, violent drug dealers, do not like customers or runners or distributors skimming. And what better message to send when you got a $100,000 debt that if you owe me $100,000, I'm not going to just kill you. I'm going to kill three additional family members. That's, that's motive. 
And indeed, Gene, while they're looking at this crime scene video, because we cannot look at it, to sh we, we do not show uh, deceased <laughs> bodies up close and personal here at the Law and Crime Network. You have to go into the courtroom in Florida if you want to get that. Uh, but let's, let's think about this. You have a three-year-old child who is drowned. You have two six-year-old twins. One's drowned. One has a bullet hole to the back of the head. The prosecutor said he doesn't know why one would be have the bullet hole to the back of the head. Maybe uh, somebody shot at Brandy and missed. But can you tell me where speculation comes in as opposed to actual evidence and how the two relate? Well, all I can tell you is based on the crime scene and the way the the uh, victims were, uh, you know, put into the tub or, or uh, you know, piled on, it suggests to me that it wasn't just one person. So that defeats the government's argument there that Mr. Segura was a, was a lone ranger he acted, uh, he acted violently by himself. That suggests there's more than one person that did this crime. Oh, that, that's interesting because the children were found stacked one on top of the other, the three children in the bathtub. Now, did you hear anything, did the prosecutor mention anything in the opening that you heard of that could indicate how the, ch how the children were killed in relation to the mother? In other words, was the mother killed first and the children or the children first and the mother? Did you hear anything that would enlighten that? Well, I got to plead guilty when it comes to ignorance. I did not see the opening. Okay, so let's let's think about a scene though. Uh, you're coming. You're a police officer. You come into a scene. Obviously, you yep. weren't there when the murders occurred, and you have three children in a bathtub on top of one another, and a dead mother who was also shot seven or eight times, but ultimately was bludgeoned to death. Uh, what would you be looking for to tell you whether or not there's, this may have been torture that the kids were shot one by one in, uh, in front of her, or whether or not the kids were shot to get them out of the way? What would you be looking for? Well, the first thing I would look for is I would I would suspect that the mother was killed first and that the children were initially put in a room, locked the room, maybe tied up the kids. But I suspect the mother was killed first, because if that killer or killers started killing those kids, that mother would be like an angry tiger trying to protect that those children. So I think that the mother was killed first. And then they went after the kids. It, it's 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 sort of like that movie in Cold Blood, that Kansas murder. It, that's the way that you would possibly kill all four people. Well, you know, Gene, let me tell you, the mother did put up a struggle. There was a broken nail to the scene. There was a pot, uh, a planted pot that was turned over. It does, and there was blood spatter everywhere. Uh, spatter, not splatter, because you know I'm a fanatic about that. Uh, it does look like she put up a struggle. The question is, was the struggle one that was for her life or her kid's life? So how do you, how do you separate that, if you can at all, or does it even yeah. not even make a difference? I, I, I don't think it makes a big difference. But, but it just supports my theory that, you know, she probably got killed first because he, whoever did it or the people that did it, they killed her first. And then they had to kill the three children, sadly, because they be, could be potential witnesses. And would you think that depending on, we haven't heard what the medical examiner is going to say, depending on the nature of the shots, that some of the shots could have been torture shots to her if indeed she was killed eventually by being bludgeoned. Uh, you know, this is what you do. This is for the first 10,000, the second 10,000, the third 10,000. Is that a possibility I, I, you would look into? Yes. And that goes to uh, sending a message, and that supports what I call the cartel theory, that this person or these people were violent. And they wanted to send a message to other creditors or debtors, actually, that if you don't pay me or you take my money, here's what's going to happen. Read about in the papers the mother and the three children got killed because she was skimming $100,000. Sends they, in a, a powerful message. message. And one final question, Gene. There was a spade found at the scene that uh, was obviously placed there after uh, the spatter occurred. Uh, is that, could that be a calling card for a drug cartel? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The only thing is, if you don't find any DNA, that, that cuts both ways. If there's no DNA, then these are professional, experienced killers that know how to take somebody's life without leaving any fingerprints or DNA. While they're changing witnesses in the Henry Segura case, we're going to take a quick break. Stay with us here only on Long Crime Network. We will hear the analysis of our great experts, and I have them after the break.